All right, well, I'm really glad to be back in San Francisco. I moved away about a dozen years ago. I used to live in Noe Valley, and it's just great to be back. Um, so today we're going to talk about uh, how you actually get stuff done. And, uh, you know, we've had a lot of uh, great presentations on capabilities, uh, but the real question that a lot of folks ask is, well, how do I get started? What do I need to do? How do I talk to my leadership about graphs? How do I explain what the opportunity is? And I'll tell you one thing, you know, I've been working in data for probably 25 years now. Nobody gives a crap about data. They don't. They really don't. What they, give, what they care about is they care about experiences. They care about analytics. They care about insights. And so Neo4j, as much as we love it, and we think it's terrific and, it, and it's so powerful, um, you go up a couple levels in an organization, and it all just becomes a blur. They want to know, what can you do that's new with this approach you're telling me about? And so um, what I'm going to share with you today is a way, sort of a structured way, that you can go from zero to an enterprise deployment. And it's essentially the same pattern that we follow at EY. And as Lance mentioned, um, we are very pleased to be able to sponsor Neo4j. Um, it's a huge opportunity. Um, there's a ton of work to be done. My basic prediction is that I think that within about 10 years, something like 50% of the SQL workloads will move over to graphs in one way, shape, or form. All right. So. Next. All right, so uh, I think uh, people have seen various versions of this kind of slide. Um, traditionally, you had single vendor, monolithic databases, uh, SQL-based. There's been a whole explosion of NoSQL solutions. Uh, the basic philosophy here is, um, you know, rather than torturing your data to fit a single data model, figure out solutions um, that uh, can retain your data fidelity and use your data in the shape that it's already in. Um, we're going to be talking about graph databases here in the lower right, but you'll see throughout this talk, I'm going to reference some of these other systems. Um, why are graphs popular? So the underlying internals of graphs, graph mathematics, graph data design, all that stuff, it's been around for a long time. You just couldn't deploy it because you didn't have the capability to. And I believe that if Larry Ellison had what we have now, SQL would look totally different. Remember, once you get past the concept diagram in your SQL design exercise, everything else is a workaround to conserve CPU and memory in SQL. Graphs are essentially exploiting the fact that we have really cheap memory, and that cost of that memory is continuing to fall. And so you can go look around on the cloud platforms, and you know, several years ago, AWS uh, offered uh, their X1 servers with four terabytes of memory. Last year, Microsoft has got uh, machines now that have 12 terabytes of memory. So it's, um, it's quite likely that within, you know, next two, three years, we might see 100 terabyte VMs, and we may even see by the end of the decade, you know, um, petabyte scale VMs. So it's really quite interesting what's going on. And the implication here is that um, you now have the opportunity to put a, a really vast quantity of data on a single server. You don't have to pay the penalty of network connectivity that you would with a distributed commodity server system. So the other underlying part of this paradigm is that because of, of these really uh, capable VMs that are now coming online, it actually is challenges some of the older thinking around distributed systems. Um, and obviously, the fastest I.O. you can get is motherboard I.O. rather than network I.O. Um, I think this graph has been shown. I just grabbed this uh, this morning. Uh, graphs are still taken off in terms of popularity among developers. And who here is brand new to graphs? Raise your hand if you are. Okay, good. All right, this is great. Um, so super quick, what is a graph? A graph is a visual representation of how uh, data is connected. Um, and uh, I'm going to be talking a lot about the labeled property graph model, which is Neo4j's model. I think it's actually very easy for people who have thought about SQL for a long time to get their heads around. Um, and so basically, um, you know, a graph shows how data is related. This is an example of an e-commerce um, you know, data model. So I send a bunch of email to a bunch of customers, and I'm trying to get them to visit my website, and I'm trying to get them to buy some product that's sold on that website. 
And if you go talk to a business owner and you say, show me how your business works, they'll go grab a marker, they'll stand up by the whiteboard, and they'll start sketching out stuff like this. And one of the really interesting things is that these diagrams, you know, they convert over to nodes and relationships. And very quickly, you can actually start roughing in a graph schema that has very high fidelity to the way the business thinks about their business. And that's an important point because that actually lends itself to the, to the entire agility and velocity of the project. And so in this diagram, you know, we have the semantic representation. You know, here's what the description of the business is. We send email to people so they'll get to the website, buy our product. We know what that looks like from a process perspective. We can represent that in a graph. And then when we start loading data into a system like Neo4j, we can actually have a schema that does exactly this. Once that data is in, then I can write uh, query traversals. And so uh, Neo4j's query language is a declarative language like SQL. Um, but the difference is, is that rather than declaring sort of in the f mode of a bricklayer, I need this table, I need to figure out my joins, I need the next table, I need to figure out my joins, I need the next table, I need to figure out my joins. In, uh, in Cypher, you think much more like a snake, okay, where you're saying I need to traverse, you know, uh, through this geography, uh, through this landscape, and I need to hit different things along the way. And so if we take a look at this very short query, um, uh, what we're doing here is we're writing a path through the graph, and we're declaring that we want to see data that satisfies this path. And the way that, a, C, uh, that um, a graph database works is that you'll get a row of data back every time that traversal is true. And so here we're saying, let's send in, you know, show me all the email that was sent to a person uh, who, has a, who has a name value of Steve Newman, and I'm going to require that this person will have visited the website, and I'm going to require that Steve, you can see the runtime variable, the tuple uh, P, will have, has also purchased a product that was sold on the website. And anybody that's done SQL will immediately recognize this is a correlated subquery. And you'll also notice how compact it is. This is very common with uh, graph expressions when you convert SQL over to graph. And so, of course, um, this is going to pull all the emails to Steve as long as Steve went to the website and purchased a product. If Steve never visited the website or never purchased a product, we get no results back. Okay, what about graphs? So graphs are everywhere. Um, uh, this actually was my favorite tagline when I st first started interacting with Neo4j. So any kind of densely connected system, data, process is almost always inherently a graph. Um, you can have graphs that are complex hierarchies. So for example, uh, I've got ships, I've got containers on those ships, right? Those represent uh, bills, you know, those are described by bills of lading. Inside those containers are packages that have destinations that are going to, and those containers are going to get offloaded onto trucks, and they're going to go to warehouses. Very, very complex graph, um, uh, typically associated with things like supply chain. Any kind of componentry is also a graph. And so if you think about uh, the concept of a, of a digital twin, um, you've got uh, graphs that are, um, you know, built of, you know, assemblies, sub-assemblies, components, subcomponents, and so forth. And um, you think about the cost of, you know, uh, of those items. You think about their availability. You think about long lead times. Graphs can become very important for analyzing things like this. And then I made this point earlier. Of course, every single SQL database is, in fact, a graph. And they lend themselves to being very quickly ported over into graphs. There's lots of use cases in graphs. Um, I think you're probably familiar with most of them. What I will say is that nearly all of our clients begin with some kind of a 360 view. It might be a customer 360 view, it might be an asset 360 view, or a project 360 view. And this is pretty typical because in large enterprises, you have many different databases and applications that are all driving towards some common business goal. And uh, it's not uncommon for business stakeholders to say, I need to see everything that's going on with this customer, with this asset, with this project, et cetera. Um, and the end state um, can very realistically look basically like this, where um, I have some kind of a data lake shown there in the blue layer. It's consuming a variety of different data types, ranging from unstructured to streams. And I've got a graph that's that's basically serving the role of a unification layer where I've got a consistent uh, set of, 
uh, semantics, a consistent taxonomy, and I've elevated from my data lake into the graph the most business valuable data. And I've done basically a data value engineering exercise, a conversation with the business that says, you know, what, are, what is the important stuff you want to connect? Having done that, now I have an opportunity through all of the terif terrific driver and API support that's associated with Neo4j to connect my applications, uh, my BI suite, uh, and then open it up even uh, for my data, or my data scientists. So we'll typically, when we do projects, we'll start you know, with one of these interest groups. It might be way over on the marketing side, or it might be in the sales side, or it might be something around operations. And then typically we'll begin with one data domain, and it's not, not unusual for it to spread uh, very quickly to other data domains. Okay, so what are we talking about today? Um, today we're talking about a roadmap for how to do these graph projects. And this is a general process. Um, and uh, you can leverage this. Um, these slides will be distributed. Um, but generally speaking, um, you'll need a small team, a graph architect, some kind of a data engineer uh, who knows Python and, and uh, tools like Kettle or ETL, et cetera, um, a full stack developer, uh, possibly a data scientist if you're interested in deep analytics, or maybe some kind of a report, BI, or front-end developer if you're thinking more experientially or uh, for operations. So generally speaking, um, the key thing is to figure out, is the problem that, that is uh, under consideration, is it truly graphy? Which means, if we put it into a graph, can we expect a big lift um, around this problem? Can we solve it? And then uh, generally, what what I recommend is that you get, get your hands on Neo4j and start building something on your laptop. Make a very simple POC that just shows that, in fact, you can create kinds of queries that your business has never been able to pull off before. And then we go into a pilot mode, um, which is typically based off of a snapshot of data. And that'll teach you a whole lot about your environment. It'll teach you about some of your assumptions. You have an opportunity to refactor. Um, and then you go into your production build. And so typically there's, a, there's sort of a set of activities that tend to overlap across these steps, but there, you know, there's a lot of stakeholder input in the beginning. You do some graph design work. There's a ton of data work usually. Uh, you start thinking about your APIs, your data services, how you're gonna mobilize your data. Um, and then you know, some more work around integration and refinement, um, applying lessons learned as you move from your pilot into your production. And then it's really about scaling, hardening, and um, it becomes very typical of any large enterprise software deployment. Um, and of course, there's a set of key conversations that you can have as you develop your graph project. And one of the really great things about graphs, particularly Neo4j, is they're very easy to refactor. I can roll in new data, load it into the graph, and then decide how I want to connect it to my existing graph later. I can change the relationships without affecting the underlying data. I can add new relationships. I can deprecate relationships. I can refactor properties um, into labels, for example. Lots of different things that you can do um, as, you, as you get your arms around data. Um, you don't have to basically do the same kind of really gruesome refactoring that you would in a typical data warehouse. Um, so what's a graphy problem? So these are some of the key characteristics of graphy problems. Anything that requires many entities, um, anything that involves recursion, anything that, it that involves uh, complex hierarchies. Um, so there's a whole class of use, use cases, um, algorithmically driven, that depend critically on the relationships and the data that those relationships carry. And so you think about wayfinding, you think about shortest path analytics, all these kinds of things. Um, you're not really talking about the data, you're talking about the relationships between the data. Um, and then anything that requires uh, you know, complex identity mapping where you might have to reconcile identities or you might have to support multiple identities um, uh, simultaneously. And so we see a lot of this with data lake unification. And then of course, um, since Neo4j is an in-memory graph database, it's really fast. And so if you've got um, you know, some system and you've got a, you know, a pretty good d data design, but the thing just isn't running very fast, just simple raw performance uh, can be gained um, by moving uh, that data environment over to a graph. And so most importantly though, talk to the business. Uh, most business stakeholders will have a, lo a large backlog of problems that have been failed to be addressed historically. And you know, you ask them questions. What do you want to see? 
What, could you, what can't you do? What, answer, what questions can't you ask and answer? And then, when, and then it's also important to see if you can pin down your business stakeholders on what would be a compelling demo that you, the stakeholder, would like to turn around and show your leadership when we go and actually ask you know, the CIO for budget to do this thing. Um, so how do you get started yourself? So the first thing you do, and if you haven't done it yet, go do it right now, which is go download Neo4j. So it's neo4j.com slash download. And you'll get the Enterprise Edition, nice desktop wrapper around it, and you can fire up a graph. And um, some of the things that aren't necessarily completely made, made clear is that um, there's a really great uh, set of utilities called APOC. And you want to make a couple of key configurations to move data in and out of your graph using APOC. And so they're listed here. Um, we'll distribute this, and, um, and you can uh, uh, take a look at these. And then, the th and then probably the very first thing you need to do is you go through some of the basic lessons. There's some great self-learning uh, tutorials that ship with, uh, with the distributed version of Neo4j. You can get into them from the browser. And then you want to begin. Um, developing your facility to move data in and out of Neo4j. So learn how to do load CSV functions. And you can use Neo4j's loader, or you can use the APOC loader. And uh, the point that I'll make here is that any reasonably sized laptop should be able to develop a graph that will have millions of nodes and relationships in it. It's no big deal. Um, uh, and that's because graphs are so compact. And then, uh, you know, for extra credit, go out to Neo4j-examples and begin to clone the GitHub projects. And you can basically find starter projects that will show you end-to-end -end examples of full-stack applications that use your favorite language, you know, whether it's Python or Java or JavaScript or Go or whatever. Um, and then the next step is uh, once, you've, you know, once you've kind of figured out how Neo works, then, then go grab some data. My recommendation is you know, start with three or four data sources. Uh, begin with some simple SQL snapshot queries, pull down the CSV files, and load them into your graph. You use common sense um, you know, uh, labels and nodes uh, for your, gr your initial graph design. And then don't be afraid of recursion. So you know, um, in SQL, recursion is sort of this weird thing that you know, people try to avoid or, or you know, sort of sits outside the, the actual design because nobody really wants to do recursive queries in SQL. In graphs, you can, you can do recursion all day long. And so I can do something like this. You know, this is that little line of code there. That's basically an entire HR graph. Here's an employee that reports to an employee, right? Very simple set of relationships, but um, it's very powerful. And you can tell by the directionality of the relationship who the, who the boss is, right? So the boss is the person on the right. And then, um, you know, there's a bunch of uh, Neo4j modeling that's out there. Don't get too hung up on this at this stage. Um, you know, just follow your common sense. Um, use, use simple semantics, use simple naming, so that if you go show your graph design to your business stakeholder, they'll recognize the entities and the relationships. And it might even be the same stuff that your business stakeholder whiteboarded for you. Um, there's a great uh, uh, website called apcjones.com slash arrows that will allow you to draw to do diagrammatic schema design. Um, we use this a lot, and I'm going to show you a bunch of these schemas. And then test your design. Write a bunch of queries against it. See if you can break it. See if it tells you new things. And if it doesn't tell you what you think you, it should be telling you, go back and look at your design. And so here are some example designs to get you thinking. Um, so in the world of, say, supply chain and contracting, um, you might have a graph design that looks like this. And so as you're doing your mental map between graph and SQL, recognize that each one of these circles here could be a table in a SQL environment. Um, and uh, there would be dozens or millions of records in each one of those tables. And in a graph, um, those are all loaded as nodes, and they're given a common set membership by the label. And so here, we have a product supply uh, chain a set of nodes, uh, we've got some tracking and traceability, and the key, the key thing that's going on in this graph here is we're looking at how invoicing is occurring, we're looking at contract entities, uh, we're looking at who is the actual service provider, and you can see that there's a very complex hierarchy, uh, and it might, may tie out to things like master agreements and so forth. So this might be, you know, a, a uh, solution for, say, a, um, uh, a chief procurement officer who wants much better reporting. 
customer 360 graph, say, in the consumer space. Um, so here I have a customer um, who's really the center of this graph, and what I'm doing is I'm surrounding this customer with a bunch of other data elements um, around the customer segment, various digital interactions, products that they may have purchased, uh, the actual transactions, the tender types. Uh, we've built many graphs like this, and then it goes all the way out to you know, account concepts like the email address, the billing address, credit card, and so forth. Right? Again, dozens of tables, all being rendered simultaneously in an in-memory graph. All of this data is available, and you can write really rich queries against it with just a couple of hops. Here's another one. Uh, master data management is a big deal in graphs. And um, uh, you can use graphs to basically um, uh, algorith algorithmically determine what is your golden record. And so an approach for that is, say I have a B2B scenario, I've got customers who are really businesses, and those customers have contacts, and the quality of those contact records depends on a set of core data elements that might be being supplied by a variety of different legacy applications that have different levels of authority. I can actually put that level of authority as a value on the relationship, and then I can do a runtime query that says, give me the best email address, the best, um, the best uh, um, physical address, uh, the best phone number, and all of those details may have come from a web form, an invoice, or something else that all have different levels of authority. Um, data discovery across different types of data. Um, and um, so here, this is, this is uh, something that we do a lot of. Um, so we might have a lot of structured data that's coming out of databases, but most companies will also have a lot of unstructured data. So you think XML and JSON that might be coming off of you know, register systems or legacy applications, um, things like that. Um, and then they might also just have a bunch of documents um, that sit as, you know, as PDFs, um, proprietary data formats, et cetera. And you can mobilize all of this data and make it discoverable in the context of a graph. Um, once your POC is, is um, done, then um, uh, you want to think about your applications that you're putting on top of it. So you want to think about, you know, what are my real breakthrough queries? Um, I want to really start thinking about my use case. Maybe you go out and look at some of the, you know, some of the literature on a particular use case. And then you want to think about how you pull that data up into an application. And um, one, I'll give you a quick hint. Um, if you haven't checked out the grand stack, um, it's quite powerful and will help accelerate you in connecting your graph um, to uh, very powerful applications uh, that you can build in React. Um, and again, what you're really doing is you're focusing on the business value. You should have a stakeholder meeting um, and show, show your work at this point. We'll dip into GraphQL for just a second. So what GraphQL allows you to do is essentially sidestep some of the middleware that's associated with a typical REST API. And the way GraphQL works is that the database itself publishes the full schema of data points that are, that are available to applications. And so then an application can actually query that schema directly. And then a GraphQL query is essentially a post with a JSON snippet. And so you can see here, number one, I've got a Power BI and I've got a curl wrapper um, around, um, uh, around a little query, and the query is shown there. That uh, post uh, goes to the GraphQL endpoint where all of the available data is typed um, and then is converted into Cypher and then handed back. And so this makes for very lightweight transactions and it also takes out this entire level, layer of abstraction um, between um, the application and the database. So people that run the database publish the data that's available. People that are writing the applications can see exactly what data is available and only pull the data that they want. So this is very powerful. Um, and here's an example of a report um, that does this. Um, so this is done in React, and um, I built this with the React Starter Kit. And uh, you know what's going on here is we're pulling some data out of graph, we're pulling some data out of Couchbase, and over on the right there we actually have the blob pointers uh, to the original uh, documents. In this case, they're all PDFs um, that are sitting in Azure. All of this is made mobilized by the graph. All right, so now we're in pilot phase, and in pilot phase, um, 
what I recommend is that, you know, pick a cloud that your business uses. Don't do something, don't pick a different cloud, for example. Um, use the marketplace images if you can. So for example, on Azure, you, there's a, basically a, a point and shoot image for either a single instance Neo4j VM or a cluster. Start with a single instance. Uh, generally speaking, you're gonna need about as much RAM as half of the size of your SQL database on disk. Um, I typically will attach external drives and keep the data there so that I can change the server out if I want a bigger or smaller server. Um, you figure out your architecture, understand your processing. Um, I love Python. I do a lot of work in Python. Um, it's good for getting, th getting things done quickly, um, and there's a great uh, Neo4j Python driver. Um, Neo4j has a high-speed loader, and then, of course, you can't escape data, data cleansing. 80% of all data projects um, are, you know, it's all the data cleansing. And then if you need any help, you can reach out to your friendly system integrator uh, or Neo4j services, um, and uh, you'll find, uh, you know, a deep body of expertise who can get you over rough spots. Um, my philosophy for, around, for doing graph data projects is what I call an iframe model. And basically, you know, you figure out what are the minimum viable data domains you need to work with. Um, you put the graph on top of that. Um, you make choices in the graph design that you know um, are going to help the, the eventual target application. Figure out what is the least amount of middleware you can put in place to surface the graph data. This is why I'm introducing GraphQL here. Um, and then um, get that edge experience built as quickly as possible. If you can do all of this in you know, just a couple of months, you can maintain velocity around your enterprise discussion um, with this technology. And then later on, you can take that same data uh, resource, and maybe there's additional uh, opportunities for new experiences. And then finally, you can go out and expand horizontally on, the, on your data domains themselves as you get into bigger and bigger scale. So that's a model that we use a lot. So here's an example architecture uh, for, say, a sales and marketing data warehouse that uses polyglot persistence and is unified by a Neo4j graph. And um, you know, what we like to do is we like to leverage um, you know, some of the core modules um, that are offered um, in the cloud. Um, each cloud provider has a set of enabling um, you know, tools and applications. Um, and then I typically like to put uh, into those cloud environments uh, different types of data management uh, systems that are specific to the data that I'm working with. And so I might use Couchbase, I might use Snowflake as a warehouse. Um, there's great tools uh, out there for moving data around at enterprise scale. Uh, so for example, Kettle um, has a Neo4j plugin where you can load data um, through you know, structured EP, uh, ETL scripts, um, very visual. Um, and then you'll have a data service on top of this, and then you, know, you can surface data into whatever your executional platform is, or your data science platform, or your reporting platform. Um, just as an example, um, you know, when you're traversing a lot of different kinds of environments, um, you, know, you can basically take a very large amount of data um, and reduce it. So for example, um, I just did a demo where I took five terabytes of data in Azure, I turned it into about five gigabytes of um, documents in Couchbase and pulled that over into about two gigabytes of Neo4j graph with pointers that went back to all of the original Azure documents. And so this is a, typo, a pretty typical pattern. Okay, um, and just to show you um, how quickly you can do this. So once your data is cleaned up, yep, um, you can, uh, uh, you leverage Neo4j's fast loader tool. And so here you can see we're loading um, about a half a billion nodes and two billion relationships in just over an hour and a half, or, or at an hour and a half. And then um, we've talked a little bit about analytics, so I'll just remind you that graphs are great for searching, uh, you can do reasoning with them, and you can also do lots of interesting things around graph topology. And then there's a whole body of work, uh, this is what Amy uh, uh, mentioned, um, where you're using graphs to actually engineer features for additional deep learning um, exercises. And a sandbox for doing something like that might look like this. So this is an AWS example, um, where, there's ba where it's basically Neo4j on top of Hive, um, where we're also running um, whatever your machine learning application is uh, that you like. And that could be H2OAI, it could be TensorFlow, et cetera. Okay, 
And then the final step, going into production. And it, when you go into production, um, this is really when the Neo4j project begins to look like pretty much any other large-scale data project that's being executed at your company. You're going to follow your, your IT best practices, uh, think about security, what actual data do you need in that production system. It might be different than in your pilot system. Um, you know, you might want to be masking, you know, PII, you know, all of those kinds of considerations. You want a full stack of environments going from dev all the way up to prod. You know, think about DevOps automation. You want test automation. You want to do load testing against your APIs. You want to monitor all your logs. Um, think about, look at the queries that are coming in and maybe refactor or redesign or re-index to make those queries run faster. Um, and then think about leveraging that iframe model um, so you can take this same, um, the same installation and deliver more value with it. And so um, I'll close out here. Um, and the key thing um, about um, the key thing about um, Neo4j is that because it's so flexible, you can really drive a lot of agility into what are considered pretty clunky kinds of data projects at the enterprise level. And you can iterate so quickly on Neo4j that you can have a really rapid cadence of conversations with your business stakeholders. And so I'm calling out all of these conversations. Uh, down here on the bottom. These are important to do, and it'll help uh, land the project with the enterprise. It'll help you secure budget and um, support and resources, um, and ultimately will help the graph become a sticky solution uh, inside your company. We've done lots of projects. Um, this is just a, a handful of them. Um, we've done you know, massive uh, global 360 account views for B2B companies. Um, we've reconciled e-commerce data and retail data on a national scale for a footwear company. Uh, we've got recommendation engines uh, that are uh, currently in production for, um, on mobile apps in production uh, for a cruise line. Uh, we've done mon money laundering, um, event recommendations, um, HR uh, applications, all kinds of things. Okay, so I'll stop there um, with just a couple of reminders. So how do I get a better understanding of my customers to create more relevant experiences? That's really where graphs come into play. How can I mobilize and syndicate data? Uh, how can I get more business value and better insights? And really, what's the next best action I can take um, in whatever my business context is? And graphs um, will speak uh, very well to all of these questions. So with that, I'll stop. We have time for probably just a, a few questions, and then lunch is, is uh, upstairs. Um, so uh, if you have any questions, uh, fire away. Sure. How much do you lean on actually heavily on cache space to keep track of everything that's happening within the airport? It is, yeah. And there's, um, and there's a set of very good connectors uh, between Neo4j and Couchbase. Yeah, so what I'll do is, um, is I'll generate I'll generate those UUIDs on Couchbase load, and then that becomes the document ID, and then that document ID, then I'll push farther up into Neo4j. That's exactly right. Yep. Hey, Stu, what's the latest strategy for getting your customers to engage with the company and get them excited about the product? So the question is, um, uh, is uh, Neo4j's um, uh, since there's a VM limit on the amount of memory, uh, does that limit Neo4j's scalability? So that's a complex question. And the reason it's a complex question is because it depends on the graph design and the data that you're going to put into your graph. Um, in my practical experience, I've yet to run into an actual um, VM-imposed limit on the work that we're doing with graphs. Um, I've built graphs that have billions and billions of nodes. And, um, and have only exceeded the terabyte size graph a couple of times. And so one of the things to keep in mind is that graphs are very compact. They don't have any nulls. You only write data where you have data. Um, and, um, uh, and then uh, if you have a thoughtful graph design, you're going to pick um, data that you, want, that you want to have in the graph. So, you wouldn't, so for example, digital data. I'm probably not going to build a graph that has every single impression in it, but I might I aggregate my impressions in Spark and push those counts up in the graph, but I may keep the raw clicks, for example. Um, and 
if you're really concerned about scale, on, and there are some government agencies um, out there, um, uh, you can actually go get yourself a, a uh, 500 terabyte um, uh, physical machine from IBM that'll run Neo4j beautifully. And I know a couple of instances like that. So, um, but what I, um, so I don't, I have, in practical terms, I don't see any scale issues. Um, what uh, is coming around the corner, though, is that um, there is discussion around how Neo4j can shard, and then there's also a lot of discussion around how you integrate with Spark, so you can do OLAP queries on, uh, say, subgraphs. We use relational for uh, certain kinds of data sources, or if I'm building a data lake, for example. It depends a little bit on the client, right? But uh, like Snowflake, for example, is a, is, a, is a serverless relational database, right? Just like Redshift, right? So um, uh, it just, it depends. Um, but what we typically do is that we will always be consuming data out of relational databases, and there's great connectors for doing that. It tends, like sometimes, you know, we still have to support legacy applications. Yeah, yeah. So you can, absolutely, yeah. But in, pra in practical terms, you usually end up having some SQL running around, yeah. Other questions? Oh, you can tell me your question, I'll repeat it. Um, so the question is, if I have internet scale data, um, how does it do the loading? Um, so um, there are, there's a bunch of technical documentation on the Neo4j site that will tell you uh, exactly how that works. Um, Neo4j clustering uses what's known as a raft, al raft algorithm that requires an odd number of consensus servers to execute the write. Um, and then um, in their clustered architecture, you can have as many read replicas as you want. Hundreds, and so, and s yep. So, so uh, Neo4j um, is an in-memory graph. Um, now there are strategies if the data is is physically larger than your VMs, uh, and there's and you haven't been able to des design your way around that. Uh, what you can actually do is you can warm up parts of your graph, so you can have a much larger graph sitting on disk. So an example might be, I have a global, um, I, you know, I have a global footprint, and I have data for APAC, I have data for Europe, and I have data for the US. I could have all of that data sitting in a single graph on disk, but then in as far as my applications are concerned, I might, have only the, I might only have warmed up the US part for my US load, and so forth, Europe for Europe, APAC for APAC, and um, the bolt drivers will actually allow you to route to specific servers to get to that in-memory uh, cache. So that's, that's a typical strategy. All right, so why don't we stop there. If you have any other questions, feel free to approach me. Um, lunch is upstairs. All right, thank you.